Welcome back, everyone. We're here for Track and Field Black History. My name is Anderson, and we are joined by an amazing legend, uh, one of the top athletes from not only from Jamaica, but one of the top athletes in the sport to ever touch the track. Um, he is an Olympic silver medalist from the year 2000, the 2000 Olympics. Um, he's a three-time world outdoor medalist as well, and also a world indoor gold medalist throughout his career. Um, and he's won multiple medals at the Pan Am Games, the uh, Central American Caribbean Games, the you know juniors, World Juniors, Pan Am Juniors, so many, so many accolades that we can name. Um, but we are joined by Sanjay Ayer. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So just to kind of start off, um, you know, happy belated birthday. I know your birthday was, you know, just passed. Did you get the chance to kind of enjoy a little bit? Yeah, yeah, um, definitely got a chance to enjoy it. Um, this year, my birthday, you know, fell on Father's Day um, and also Juneteenth. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was, it was, it was three, three for one. <laughs> yeah, but it was a, it was a great experience um, to spend time, you know, with the family and the kids. Yeah. Nice, nice. That's beautiful to hear. Yeah, a lot, a lot going on during the time, but yeah, good, glad that you got to celebrate a little bit with the kids and the family. Um, so, of course, to dive a little bit into your background, you've had a very eclectic career, but, you know, of course, born in Jamaica and just curious what it was like for you growing up in Jamaica during the 80s and the 90s. And then, of course, later moving to uh, New York City. Well, I mean, great, great experience, you know, growing up on the island um, in, in the 80s, you know, Jamaica, you know, always had a great history in sports, track and field. Um, cricket was big at the time. Um, football, soccer, you know, we, we call it here in the U.S., um, was emerging as a sport. Um, so I played a lot of sports as a kid um, at a very young age. You know, my dad um, put me in soccer. Um, and, you know, growing up in Jamaica, we didn't have a lot of organized sports as kids have it here in America now. You know, we will just, you know, go outside and play, you know, and we'll go outside and play early in the morning and we just play all day, you know, any sports that the kids in the community wanted to play, you know, we, we participated, you know, in those sports. Um, and, you know, just, just having the joy of, of, of growing up on a small, small island, um, you, know, our, you know, the people from Jamaica, they're very prideful um, in, in everything, you know, they do. Um, and it really, you know, helped my upbringing um, growing, up, growing up on the island. Did you ever find kind of a tug of like, you know, you had track and field, you had cricket, you had, you know, football. Did you ever gravitate towards one sport or was it immediately track and field at first? No, no, actually, um, you know, I grew up playing football, grew up playing soccer my whole childhood years, all the way up on, until high school. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, I got to Excelsior High School in, in 1996 is when I really started taking, taking track and field serious. I did track and field um, in elementary school, you know, at 10, 11 years old. Um, and I did pretty well in the sport. Um, but, you know, soccer was always the main sport for me um, until, you know, when I got to 16 years old, I really started, you know, paying a lot of attention to track and field and just going hard. And then, of course, you moved from Jamaica to New York. Um, yeah. You, you attended, I think it was D. Witt Clinton High School in the Bronx, right? Yes, yes, I did. Now, and were you actually living in the Bronx or did you just go to high school there? No, no, no. I lived in the Bronx. You know? So when I migrated um, to the U.S. in 1997, um, I moved to the Bronx um, and, you know, started high school in the Bronx. Um, and after my first year of high school, um, I moved to Brooklyn to live with my aunt. Um, once I lived with Brooklyn with my aunt, I would make that long commute on the train. <laughs> uh, a 45, 45 to one hour commute on the train um, back and forth each day just to go to high school, you know. Um, but, but it was a fantastic experience. Um, and I would love to relive the moment again if I could. <laughs> nice. I, I feel you. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm born and raised. I live in New York now and I grew up in Queens and I went to high school okay. in Harlem. So I, I kind of feel the, the long commute for sure on the train. Yeah. 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 What high school did you go to in Harlem? 
I went to Manhattan Center for Math and Science. So it was okay, like, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So there was a couple times, you know, we'd go up to, because uh, I was running the PSAL, we'd go to Clinton High School, run the track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. And what was that transition like, you know, going from Jamaica, coming from Jamaica, you know, migrating to New York City, right? A completely different environment. What was that, you know, kind of experience like? Yeah, I think it was a, a easy transition for me. Um, because when I was in Jamaica, um, I just really wanted to come to America to live. Mm. Um, track was going well in Jamaica, um, but I just felt like if I moved to the US, I would have more exposure as an athlete. I was still in, in, in high school yeah. and, and I felt like coming to the States would give me more opportunities to showcase my talent you know, for the collegiate coaches. So I made a move to America with, with, with a year and a half left in high school um, and, and just went head on with everything. And there was no turning back once I got to New York City. I just, I took the whole US by storm on, on the high school and, and obviously the PSL um, circuit. Yeah, you were really dominating, like, you know, in the late 90s when you were in high school. And of course, yeah. you ended up going to Auburn. But what led to that decision to, you know, to go down to go down south as opposed to maybe going to a different school for college? Yeah, um, well, it, it all came down to the different colleges that, that I took visits for. Um, I was the high school athlete of the year, and I just came off winning the the New Balance Indoor Nationals in, in 1999 in, in Boston. And I had a lot of coaches recruiting me. Um, I went to visit Ohio State, um, LSU, Seton Hall. Um, and I think Auburn was the last visit. Um, I took one of my good friends. Um, she, she attended Auburn and she told me about Auburn. I, I knew nothing about it. Um, and once I started to talk to the coaches, talk to coach Henry Roll, who recruited me to go to Auburn and went down and visited the school. And I just felt like it was just a family environment. You know, this is where I needed to be. Um, and, and I made that commitment to go to Auburn and, and that's where everything happened. Did your family have any reservations of you? You know, you're living in New York City, but now you're going all the way down South, right? Away from family in New York. Did they have any reservations of like, you know, you're kind of a little too far for us? No, not really. I think mm -hmm. I think they were just happy for me to actually made it make it because when I came to America, I really came by myself. You know, I left my parents back home in Jamaica um, and my dad just gave me the green light, gave me the blessing and say, hey, son, um, this is what you want to do. You want to migrate. Um, I'm going to support you as much as I can with the move. Um, so it wasn't a definite that I was going to make it on to college, <laughs> you know. Um, so just to have that success and my parents know that, yeah, you know, I got a full scholarship. I'm going off to university. Um, I think they were just happy for me to, to, to succeed and move forward. Nice. That, that's really dope to hear. And you even mentioning that, like you migrated, you know, to yourself. Your parents were still back in, um, in Jamaica. Yeah. Who were some of the people that you kind of looked up to as like your support system? I know you mentioned you lived with your aunt for a little bit in Brooklyn, but did you have a kind of support system of people you looked up to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the support system I had in New York City, uh, my stepmom was there, um, my aunt, um, my club coaches, Alwyn Hutton, um, Christopher Malcolm, um, my high school coaches, um, Bradman John, um, he was very instrumental, you know, getting me over to America. He was the assistant, um, you know, Clinton coach. Um, coach Carnell Johnson, who is still the female coach at um, Clinton, was also a good mentor. Um, the boys head coach, Bill Wagner, um, you know, they also played, uh, he also played an important part, you know, with me transitioning, you know, to, to the country and to the school. Um, so those, those people you know, were very instrumental and integral, you know, in, in, in my years in New York City as a high school athlete. And then, of course, down at Auburn, I mean, you know, you, you didn't stop, right? You were successful in high school and then things just kept rolling. And that yes. first year, your freshman year, you made the Olympic team for Jamaica to go to Sydney. Yeah. Um, what was that feeling, that initial experience of like knowing that you made the Olympic team, you're going to your first Olympics? 
it was a it was a fantastic experience. But you know, as a as a track and field fan and and an athlete, you know, we know that the Olympics is every four years, um, and it just didn't start for me in two thousand, my freshman year when I was preparing. It actually started for me nineteen ninety seven when I arrived in the U.S. Um, you know, the year prior in ninety six, I watched the Atlanta Olympics. You know, from my TV in Kingston, you know, and, you know, I saw the Jamaican 4x4 national team. And one of the things that stuck out to me was when um, Gregory Houghton fell when he took that um, bat baton exchange on the second leg with the 4x4. And he rolled over and he started sprinting and got Jamaica back in the race and Jamaica went on to medal. I thought that was the most amazing thing I ever saw in all the sports. And I said, the next Olympics, I want to compete. <laughs> you know, I was only 16. I didn't know that I could make the Olympics. I had just started running track and field in, in, in high school, but that one moment, you know, stuck out to me. And, you know, I started preparing um, at 16 for the Olympics in 2000. Um, and I think the moment was just right for me. It, it was my freshman year. I had a fantastic year. Um, in 2000, as, as a freshman, I was the Southeastern Conference, you know, um, freshman of the year in track and field. Um, and, you know, went to the Jamaican trials. I was, I was the young buck. All the guys that I was competing against were 27, 28 years old. They were in the prime of their career. They had already formed a team um, from 1993 um, with that group of guys, Danny McFarlane, Gregory Horton, Michael McDonald, that was the main core group of guys. Um, and I was just the young guy coming in. Um, and, you know, I went to the trials and I, I got fourth at the Olympic trials and, and I got onto the team. One, one, one of the best moments of my life. Um, and still to this day, the Sydney Olympics is my most favorite Olympics. Yeah. Considering all the, what makes it, you know, your favorite Olympics, of course you won the medal, but, you know, considering all the competitions that you had, what makes it that favorite one for you? I think it was, I think it was the favorite for me because I was young um, and all the adversity, you know, that I went through leading up to the Olympics. When I came to New York, my first year, um, I tore my hamstring mm -hmm. um, in the indoor season in 1997, and I wasn't able to compete that year in high school because my injury was so severe. Um, and then, you know, the 99 seasons when I got a chance to compete and really did my thing, you know what I mean? Um, going to college, it, I just faced a lot of, um, just a lot of adversity um, and just, just staying dedicated and, you know, constantly inspiring myself, um, you know, leading up to that Olympics. And I just think everything that built up, you know, going into Sydney, you know, just made it, just made it, you know, really special for me to this, to this day. And I, I want to just jump back to what you were saying about, you know, watching in 1996, watching the Olympics and, you know, you kind of didn't even know what was going on to a degree, but you realized yeah. like, all right, this is what I want. This is where I want to be. This is what I want to work for. Um, how do you help your athletes that, you know, you currently coach now and you've coached through your career kind of look long-term of like, this is where we want to get to. This is where we want to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's for me just really, you know, mentoring them and, you know, sharing some of my life experiences, you know, to them. Um, it's easier when, you know, you have lived it as an athlete and your athletes could relate to, to you what you've been through. You know what I mean? Um, it makes it more believable, you know knowing that this guy has ran at the highest level and he did it at a very young age and he did it for a very, very long time consistently. Um, they're able to relate to that. Um, and yeah, that, that's the knowledge and the expertise that I give them, it, it goes a long way. Nice, nice. And so kind of flipping that as well, you know, as you're having this, you know, crazy success in, you know, late in high school and then in the 2000s, early 2000s and really through the 2000s. Um, but did you have role models that you kind of looked up to um, as you were having this success and as you were growing in the sport? Definitely, definitely had, had role models. Um, 
my first ever role model in, in track and field uh, would have been Bert Cameron. Um, Bert Cameron, I really, you know, enjoyed watching him run as a young kid. Like I've been watching the, the Olympics since age four. I remember 84 <laughs> in Los Angeles watching that Olympics and staying up late at night to watch 88 in Seoul. Um, but I remember Bert Cameron, that's his tenacity as a runner, you know, his determination, um, always wanted to, to, to be like, like Bert. Um, great mentors to me would have been my early teammates um, who are still very good friends of mine. Um, Michael McDonald, um, Danny McFarlane, um, Davian Clark, Gregory Horton, Christopher Williams. Um, those guys were OGs when I first entered the Jamaican senior national team. And as a youngster, you know, my first, my first senior team, I made it in high school at 18 years old at World Indoor in, in my rash in Japan. And, and the older guys, once I, I broke into the senior team, they just embraced me, man. They embraced me. Um, and I just always looked look up to them for mentorship. You know what I mean? Um, and I think with them being in my life so early in my career, it kind of molded me to, to just be so mature, to be so much more mature in the game. And I was, I was able to grow in the sport. Um, and even to this day, you know, those are the guys I trust, you know. I pick up the phone, I call Danny, I call Chris, I call Michael, I call Davian. Any advice as it relates to track and field, I trust those guys, you know, because we go back, we go back more than two decades. Juliet Campbell also, mm -hmm. um, very, very special teammate um, and friend to me, you know, um, Dwight Thomas, you know, we, you know, we, we were raised in sports. So some of those guys, you know, my peers and, and obviously the great legends, um, Michael Johnson, um, one of my idols also, you know, yeah. And kind of um, thinking of that, you know, mentioning all the, all the great Jamaican uh, runners, you yourself, and then like you mentioned all the other names as well. And then even noting Michael Johnson, where, you know, where you kind of came in and made your career was kind of in this post Michael Johnson era of the 400, right? Like he retired in 2000. Um, yeah. But what was it like competing during that time with, you know, not only, you know, some of the Jamaican greats that you had, but, you know, some of the others from the Caribbean, like um, there's Avard Moncourt and there was, uh, I think, Alian Francique from Grenada. Um, but just thinking of competing the 400 meters during that time, what was it like for you? Yeah, yeah I mean, it was tough. I think in the era that, that I came through, the 400 was a tough event. Like I ran the 400 at the senior level for 14 years, from 1998 to 2012. So, so I faced, you know, really tough competition with guys who were really, really good. You know, my first era um, with Michael, I got to, I had an opportunity to race against Michael in 2000 at the Olympics in the four by four. Um, I was on his farewell tour um, in 2001, when he was retiring, uh, we ran a couple of relays on tour with him in Sweden and in England. Um, Avard, once Mike retired, um, Avard Moncur, who was my training partner at Auburn, um, Avard won the NCAAs um, two years in a row. Um, I was in those NCAA finals that Avard competed in. Um, and then in 2001, Avard won the the world championships in, in Edmonton, Canada. Um, Tyree Washington was good. Um, the twins, you know, Alvin and Calvin was good. Um, and then in 2004, you know, Jeremy Warner came around. Um, Jeremy was a great phenomenal athlete, you know? So just, just going through, you know, it was tough for me. It was tough winning that individual 400 meter medal, you know. I always looked at myself as the guy who was always knocking on the door, you know, trying to, you know, get into the finals, trying to win a medal. Um, but it, it was just tough, you know. The, 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 the talent pools throughout the era. Um, I just kept on running into great, great 400 meter runners and I, I wasn't able to, to, to catch a break on that individual level. Um, but I did capitalize, you know, on the relay, 
um, for decades and and I was able to contribute consistently for my country and for myself. And what do you um, attribute to, you know, you're really a testament into that longevity. You're talking, you know, 15 years, probably more of, you know, high quality, um, you know, competition, you know, like you said, 98 all the way to, to 2012. How, what do you mean, what do you attribute to that, you know, high quality competition and, you know, you were balancing school, right? You had, you know, probably you had injuries and that you dealt with through and uh, through and through. Yeah, I think for me, just my personality, you know, I'm, mm. I'm a very confident person, very confident in anything I do. Mm. Um, and I was always motivated. Yeah. Um, I knew I wasn't the most talented 400 meter runner because I didn't have great 200 meter speed. Um, I had good speed endurance for the 400, um, but I would just run the race with a lot of heart and a lot of grit. You know what I mean? Um, and that's, that's what I was known for. And I knew very early in my career, if I could just be consistent all the time, every time I step on the track, if I could just give it my all, I knew I would have, have longevity in the sport. Nice. I love that. I love yeah. that. And thinking of, you know, when you were, as you were navigating through, um, but specifically thinking of your transition from, you know, going from Auburn and then transitioning into, you know, professional world, what was that transition like for you? And did you receive support in terms of, you know, learning how to um, navigate with agents and contracts and, you know, meets and even just like financial literacy and understanding how to be an adult? Um, did you receive support in that, in that transition? Yeah, yeah. Um, I received a lot of support, but I think more than anything else, um, when I was a young man in my young, young 20s, you know, I came to this country, I came to America by myself, came to this country by myself, 16, turning 17. So I was just way ahead of my time in regards to my maturity. I always knew what I wanted. I was really self-motivated. Um, so any decision that I was going to make in terms of career, I made sure I did a lot of research. Um, back then the internet wasn't big, you know? <laughs> so I would just call around to, you know, what I call now the OGs in the sport, you know, training partners, you know, some of the guys I mentioned, my coaches, you know, my mom, my dad, and just asking them for ex the advice. And whatever was the majority consensus, um, I would make the, the decision, you know, based on what I was told. And um, that's how I lived my life and made career, career decisions. <laughs> right. And then kind of also bouncing off that, thinking of the athletes you work with now, how do you support them as they navigate, you know, um, through their careers, whether they're really young or, you know, as they continue to get older? Man, I wish I had a Sanjay Air when I was coming through because <laughs> I, feel, I feel that I give my athletes my all everything you know so much so much emotions is tied into my coaching you know because i'm an athlete first you know um and because i'm an athlete first i i realize all the struggles you know they have to go through financially emotionally i know for jamaican athletes um i've created a lot of opportunities for my jamaican athletes by bringing a lot of athletes from jamaica you know to come to america to to pursue a, a professional career, you know, giving them contract opportunities with, you know, Puma, um, you know, with, with meat, their development, um, you know, having a good relationship with my federation to make sure that my federation could, could support the athletes, you know, which is very important. Um, so just a lot of resources that I pump into the athletes and pump into my track club and, you know, if you know, there are hundreds of thousands of athletes, you know, in the world, um, but it's only three athletes that could make an individual spot, yeah. you know, for each event, for the world championships, for the Olympics, for the Commonwealth Games. So you give a lot, but you don't get a lot back in. Um, and every time I give, you know, I give from the bottom of my heart, hoping that you know, they could make the best use of themselves, even if they don't become successful in the sport. But after the sport, being successful young men and young women in, in whatever venture they do, you know, I'm just not only a track coach, um, but I'm also a businessman. Um, and telling them that, hey, 
track and field, the sport doesn't, you know, last forever. And thus helping them to create opportunities for themselves um, during the sport while while we're going going through the paces. Um, and that helps them to transition, um, you know, once they retire from the sport, you know, yeah. Nice. That That is super, super important. I think that's a big thing because, yeah, I think, you know, maybe track, you know, track and field doesn't have as much money, but, you know, you look at so many sports where it's like young kids will get in, they'll get successful, but then they didn't learn those, that business mindset, how Absolutely. to like capitalize, right? Those things. Absolutely. Are Absolutely. All of my athletes that has come into my track club, you know, I've, I've told them, listen, you know, here are different avenues you guys could, could channel you know, in order to be successful. And, you know, most of them, you know, I have them start these ventures during their time in the club, you know, so some of them would work part-time even when they're on contract, you know, and just having, you know, that worth ethic and that dedication um, to know that, you know, they're applying this themselves. They put in something on their resume that once the sport is done, you know, they could transition into that field or if they don't want to transition into that field, they could do something else. Um, but they have already, you know, garnered some work experience um, and, you know, they've gotten the drive and the dedication to do things, you know, outside the track. Um, and quite frankly, I think it has worked well because, you know, 99% of track and field athletes, they don't make a lot of money out of the sport or they don't make money at all out of the sport. And, and sometimes, you know, they go into clubs, they go to coaches and, you know, sometimes they're, they're sold a false dream to think, oh, we're going to make millions and thousands of dollars, you know, because they might see an athlete on social media driving a Benz or flying first class. But in reality, you know, that's not really how it is. You know, we, we don't make millions in the sport. Um, so as I said, for me, just being able to give them work opportunities, creating opportunities for them and still having them run at the highest level and running top meets and, and making a national team. It's, it's, it's a win-win situation. Nice, yeah. definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, and just kind of bouncing off. So, you know, in of course the 400, the US has really dominated the 400 for, for many, many years. Um, yes. You know, even like you, you said, right? Michael Johnson was running and then there was a kind of a, a, a quote unquote like downtime where, you know, a lot of other athletes from different countries started to jump in and then, you know, things jump back with like Jeremy Warner, LaShawn Merritt. But really in the past, I think like decade, there's been a resurgence with like, you know, Karani James and then Steven Gardner and, um, you know, from Jamaica, right? You had Akeem Bloomfield and uh, Rasheem McDonald, right? Um, you know, a plethora of athletes from the Caribbean and around the world who were really kind of stepping it up in the 400. So I'm just curious on your thoughts of kind of the current athletes that we see in the 400 and really that resurgence of the Caribbean into the 400 meters now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. has been a dominant force in the 400 for many, many years. Um, it's, it's really refreshing um, the last decade, especially for me. Um, Kirani James is very important to the sport. He's really important because in terms of longevity, I think he's pound for pound the most consistent 400 meter runner we've ever seen. I don't think we've had a 400 meter runner that meddled for, for 10 years. This is going to be Kirani's 10th. If I'm not mistaken, Kirani won the, the Olympics in 2012 in London. Um, and he's still around today. Um, he won world championship. No, he won Olympic bronze last year. Yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Tokyo. Yeah, it was bronze in Tokyo. Bronze in Tokyo. Um, and I, yeah. And he also medaled in Rio. Rio, he got silver in Rio. Yeah. yeah. So, silver in Rio. And, you know, so, um, yeah, Michael Johnson, you know, got the world record and Van Kirk and those guys. But the, the 400 is a sport that burns the body. You know, the training is grueling. Um, so just to see what Karani has accomplished is amazing. Um, Stephen Gardner has, has had, had a headlock on the game in the 400 the last couple of years. Um, I think he has fantastic foot speed. Um, and, and I think Gardner has been the closest to what the Americans had when they were dominating. Michael had good foot speed. 
um, Quincy Watts, you know, those guys had great foot speed. The Caribbean guys weren't able to have that flat 200 meter speed um, until Stevie came around. Um, I know even Karani, Karani, um, he's not a 19 second guy or a 20 flat guy. You know, he's good. He has good speed endurance and he's just a heartless runner. Um, but hopefully the Caribbean could start producing more quarter milers with a strong 200 base. Um, and I think that that would really help the guys to run 43. Um, I know in Jamaica, when we were coming up, all the guys, all the young guys in high school, they want to run the 100 and the 200, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think it would really help with the development of the 400 meter runners from my country if we could have a guy who runs like 10.2, 20.6 in high school, you know, that's, that's blazing for a high schooler, but you know, you're not going to run the nine, eight as we see oblique Seville running now or the young kid Blake or what Johan and Usain ran in the world stage. They say, Hey, 10, 200 meter guy, you know, 20.5, come run the 400. Let's use your foot speed. Um, and I think if some of those guys start coming to the 400 in a proper coaching system, I think those guys would matriculate um, and develop into, into good 400 meter runners to run 43. Um, I know the Jamaican 400 meter runners of my era, even myself, I know we weren't talented as these Jamaican guys we have now. Um, Akeem Bluefield, he's a 19 second 200 meter runner. None of, none of the guys in my generation that I ran with in my first, second, or third Olympic cycle, none of us ran 19. Um, even Javon Francis, who I coach, um, he's a 20.5 guy, you know, his first year in high school. Um, me and Gregory, David, and Danny, none of, none, of, none of us was running that, you know. Nathan Allen, these guys are superior talented, you know. Uh, my generation, we just had a lot of heart and a lot of grit. Um, and we were able to run 44 consistently and win medals on the relay consistently. Um, but if we had that type of speed, I think a lot of us would have definitely ran 43. Um, so yeah, I think if we pay more emphasis to some of those fast guys who are only running, you know, 10 two in high school, um, start stepping them up to the 400, I, I think that would, you know, really help um, us not only Jamaica, but the, the Caribbean kids to um, be a, a, a strong force in, in the 400 meters. I think that's what the, the Americans have. The, the American quarter mile is they have good foot speed. And that's why you see them running 43s. You know, I was watching the U.S. trials last week and USA track and field did some analytics with the results where they breaking down the splits every 50 yeah meters and you see the 50 split the 100 the 150 the 300 and you see the top american guys like from first through seventh place the guys are coming through the 300 at 32 seconds <laughs> you know 32 seconds and they're not 32 for them is not hard because when you look at their 200 meter split they ranges from 21 1 to 21 6 and it's like a jog for them you know so it's telling me that these guys, all of them could run under 20.5 in the 200, <laughs> you know? Um, I know now, right now, our Jamaican athletes, they can't do that, you know, based on what, you know, I saw at the trials, you know? Um, and not anything to knock the guys, you know, the guys, um, they tried their hardest, you know, at the trials. They gave it their all, they competed fiercely. Um, but the times thus didn't reflect, you know, how hard they were pushing, you know. Um, and I just think that we need to, you know, go back to the drawing board and look at some of the things that I mentioned, um, make sure that they're in the right coaching system. And, and you know, we could get back to the days where we were in 44 consistent, you know. And now we know that 44 is not going to medal at, at the championships. If, if you're not running 43, <laughs> if you're not running 43, you're not, you're not prime time, you know? Um, so we got to start thinking 43 and to think 43, the numbers have to add up. You got to be running fast in the 200. Um, 
it's no way, no other way to to describe what you got to do to to get the numbers right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like you said, those forty threes. I kind of just going back to Karani. I really think Karani kind of changed the game because um, he yeah. was the first. He was the first um, non-American, I think, to break forty four seconds, and that's when you saw a resurgence. Um, and he really made it. I think. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off, but I oh. also think. I also think that Kirani might be the one and only Caribbean athlete, English speaking Caribbean athlete to win a gold medal in the 400 meters. Um, oh, is... um, I think, I think the Cuban, I think the Cuban Juan Torino might've won the 400. Well, yes. You know what he might've, well, I think Juan Torino might've won, but I think that was the maybe 1980. There was a year, okay, right? The year that like a lot of countries boycotted. Yeah, yeah, would, yeah, 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 yeah. But I know in the English speaking Caribbean, I want to say Kirani was our one and only um, 400 meter Olympic gold medalist. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So yeah. kind of connecting what you're saying, where it's like he were, he broke 44 seconds, he won the gold medal, and now he made it where it's like. I'm stepping on the track. I'm running 43 seconds at a championship, right? I may not run yes. you know, 43 in a year, but when it gets to a yeah. championship, you better be running 43 he, seconds to beat me. He's gonna, he, he's gonna show up. He's exactly. absolutely gonna show up. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So I, I definitely hear you with like a lot of a lot of guys gotta you know really put their best foot forward, and there's tons and tons of talent, um, you know, in Jamaica and in the Caribbean. Um, who are you kind of looking forward to, you know, at these upcoming world championships, right? Plethora of guys in the 400, but um, I don't know, who are, you, who are you looking forward to? Maybe in uh, some different events as well. I'm really excited about um, Sharika Jackson. Mm. Um, you know, she, she's been running the 400 for a couple of years um, and she made that transition last year, running, <laughs> running the one and the two. Um, and it was just so delightful seeing her running that 200 meter trial at the trials. Um, during that 200, I was standing in the middle of the straightaway with 50 meters to go. And she, she just lift up like a jet plane on those girls and just started opening her stride with 50 meters to go. She just started opening her stride like a quarter mile on the back stretch, you know? And I said to myself, oh my God, I've never seen a combination like this before. It's like, she looked like a one-two sprinter for the first 150. And she just went into overdrive where she just started overstriding. Like, she just looked like a quarter mile on, on the second 100 that's flowing down the backstretch. And when I saw that, I said, oh my God, if she ran this race in Oregon tonight, she would have definitely broken the world record. Mm. She'd have definitely broke the world record because our track in Kinston is not as fast as Oregon. Um, and we had just had some rain on the track, maybe like an hour before that 200 meter race. So the track was kind of soaking wet, you know? Um, so I'm excited about seeing Sharika. <laughs> um, I'm also excited about seeing Michael Norman. Um, I think, you know, he's a fantastic 400 meter runner, but he just hasn't been able to get it done. Um, and I think this is the year um, I want to see him go up against Karani um, and then the two young American kids. And I, I think him and, and Stevie, I think we might have, I think we, I think we're going to have a surprise. I think, I think we might have a world record either from Stevie or from Michael, if it's not close, if it's not a world record, I think it's going to be close. I think it's going to be in the 43-1 range, um, especially if these two collegiate kids, um, Ross and the kid from Florida, if, if, if they could hold on to the form that they have right now um, with those five guys, the two collegiate kids, Michael, Kirani, um, and Norman, I, I think it's going to be a crazy, 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 crazy race. Yeah. <laughs> nice yeah. Um, so i look i look forward i look forward to the the men's 400 and and, and sharika jackson in in, in both sprint three races there you go and i think there is it'll definitely be exciting you know it's the first time the world's is going to be you know here in the well u.s you know kind of on the you know western hemisphere right so yeah good um just one one other question um 
curious in terms of because you spoke about Sharika and you know Sharika and Fred Curley right they 400 meter runners they drop down and they're having a ton of success kind of thinking of what you were saying before do you think a lot of athletes who are coming up they see that and even like Usain Bolt right he was a 2-4 runner dropped down to the yeah. one, two do they see that and they're like I want to be like them right I don't want to stick in the 400 I want to go down to the kind of glamour events yeah yeah absolutely um you know, those, those athletes, you know, they have set the tone for what's going to happen for, for the future. Um, and not, not only the, the 100 and 200 are glamour events, but, you know, they also pay more money. You know, um, shoe companies, you know, sign athletes for more money if they do the one-two sprints. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of athletes are going to start thinking business models. A lot of these faster quarter milers are going to think, ah, should I just drop down to running a one and a two? I'll make more money and I'll have more longevity in the sport, yeah. you know? Um, so definitely, I think we'll be seeing more of that. Got it, got it. So um, just a couple of the questions to close out. So of course, you know, your post-track career, you know, you've been a very, very successful coach and you've done so many different things. Um, can you both talk about, you know, you getting into coaching and then even some of the other things that you've done in terms of the community and, you know, helping, helping athletes in various different ways? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so other than coaching, you know, I would call myself a, a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> um, I, I have various businesses that I've, that I've, that I've started, um, different community outreaches um, that I've started. Um, I own a fitness company, Maximum Velocity Performance Fitness. Um, my company, you know, we specialize in personal training, um, group fitness classes, corporate wellness programs. Um, government contracts as it relates to, to fitness. Um, I'm also um, part owner in a company, Active Dreamers. Um, my brother-in-law is the CEO. Um, it's a bedding company where we make um, bedding, pillows, sheets um, with NBA licensing. We have, you know, all the NBA players licensing. We have the players' images, you know, on the bedding products. Um, I also own a company, Two Eagle Sports, um, with my partner, Juliet Campbell. Um, We do um, sports event promotions. Um, This year, we put on a big track meet here in the Washington, D.C. area. It was the East Coast International Showcase. Um, This meet is going to be a yearly event, and the whole concept of the meet is... USA versus Jamaica, the top high school talent in the US, the top high school talent from Jamaica coming up with an individual head-to-head clash in individual um, events. Um, I think, you know, both countries love the concept. Um, We did it first at Twigo. Um, Puma is our main partners. They're a title sponsor. Um, And we, you know, we have signed a multi-year contract with them for them to be the, the title sponsor, you know, for this event. And um, we're planning to grow this event. Hopefully one day it will be big as the pen relays or even bigger. Um, community outreach programs. Um, I have done work with um, prostate cancer, um, zero in Baltimore yearly. Um, raised and helping to raise, you know, millions of dollars um, for prostate cancer in the, the African-American community. Um, and just, just mentoring athletes, um, Jamaican athletes, American athletes, athletes from the island, um, and just having a good relationship with my federation and just giving back to the sport, you know. Um, and, and, you know, I'm having other ventures that's, that's coming up. I, I want to create more international, you know, competitions um, for, you know, our pro athletes, put it on track meets, you know. Um, So those are things that you will see um, in the near future, you know, Um, but but yeah, um, the coaching is the most difficult for me at this moment, moment because I feel like as a coach, it's hard to, be successful because my success is based on my athlete's success. When I was an athlete, I could control the narrative. As a coach, I could 
give all my expertise to my athletes, give them all the great coaching I could give them, but it's up to them when they get on the line to compete well and do well for themselves, you know? Um, so that has been very difficult to me, you know? Um, I think now I just, I want to revamp, you know, my club and try to get really good, talented young athletes to, to, to help and, and to matriculate. You know, I've, I've realized that finding good athletes, good young athletes, that's really the key, you know, to success. Um, a lot of the athletes that I've had in the past, you know, they come in, I get them better and they go off to bigger name coaches. You know, they want to be in training groups that have Olympic medalists, you know. Um, so it, it's been really hard for me to, to really matriculate as a coach. Finally, last year, I finally got a good talent, you know, Javon Francis. Um, he won a silver medal in 2006 um, in, in Rio. Um, and, you know, he was on the down when I got him. I've been trying to get him for three years now. And, you know, the shoe company Puma just sent him to me last year along, you know, with his mom. Um, they said, okay, Sanjay, you've always wanted to coach Javon. Um, you know, he was on the down battle of injuries since 2017. Um, and he came to me last year, September. Um, and just, just getting him healthy, healthy again, um, because he was pretty banged up, getting him healthy, having him believe in himself, um, and just having him adjust and adapt to my program. And he's buying, he's buying, he's buying to my program and, you know, he's been successful this year. He's ran, you know, a couple of mid 45s, low 45s. We're not quite at 44 seconds as yet. Um, but I'm very confident that now he's finally back on the Jamaican national team. He's going to have the, 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 the confidence to, you know, lead, being one of the leaders on the four by four. He's the oldest guy in our relay pool. Um, and just to have him, he's more mature now. Um, and he's won countless medals for us um, on our anchor leg, you know, getting the stick in fourth and fifth position and bringing us back into to medal con and contention. Um, the country love him. Um, I remember we were in New York um, two weeks ago for the New York Grand Prix. And, you know, being in the stands and seeing how passionate the fans were about him, you know, being at the trials. And when they introduced his name, Javon Francis, the crowd just went crazy for him, you know. Um, and even though he didn't finish top three at the trials, just knowing that his presence is going to be there um, in Eugene on the 4 by 4 anything could happen if the transporter is on the relay, on that anchor leg, <laughs> you know, bringing us home. Um, so yes, hopefully having him and the great work that I've done with him, hopefully other athletes will see that and said, you know what, let's give Sanjay a shot as a coach. And, and, and hopefully after this summer, I'll, I'll get, you know, two or three um, quality athletes in and I'm gonna give them my all. And I know that they're gonna be successful if, I, if I'm given the opportunity. Nice, nice. And yeah, that's, um, that, that's crazy. Cause I know, I think last year, Javon didn't even, he didn't even compete at the Olympic or he didn't make it to the Olympics, right? He didn't even make the finals. I think at Jamaican yeah, he, he, he didn't even make the finals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He wasn't there. He's, he's been struggling for the last couple of years, um, mm -hmm. but he's in good hands now, yeah. you know, and, and he's a testament to, you know, my coaching and my mentorship and, and, and everything I could do. Um, and, and as I said, hopefully others see and 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 want to be a part of the process, and and you know have me lead them to to, to greater success. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I commend you for being able to balance all that between coaching and yes. all the, the adventures and business. Yes, that you're yes, doing. yeah. That's the coaching, trust me. The, I tell my friends and everybody. My wife would tell you the coaching is the hardest, the hardest part. It takes up most of my time. I'm the most passionate at it everything else i feel like i'm really successful at i could close my eyes and and get these deals done and, and close on these ventures but the coaching um i need to i need it i need to be successful yeah. you know and i feel myself 
I have unfinished business in track and field. I definitely have unfinished business as a former athlete. I felt like I didn't accomplish a lot of the things that I needed to accomplish. I didn't win an individual 400 meter level, um, medal at the highest level. Um, and, and as a coach, I aspire to, to coach an individual Olympic medalist. So I have unfinished business in the sport of track and field, whether it might be coaching, whether it might be as a meet promoter, whether it might be as a mentor, I want to be highly successful in this sport. And I'm very determined. I'm very determined. Nice. That, that is, that's amazing. And I think that that gives some drive, right? That pushes you to keep going, even though it's like, you know, kind absolutely. Of nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, just two last questions, a little bit different to kind of end things off, but so if you had the chance, let's say you could compete at either, you know, upcoming world champs or the Olympics, right? But you can't do your primary event. So no, you can't do the 400 meters. What event would you do? Could be on the track, could be on the field. What would you do a bit too? Well, <laughs> it's, 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 it's crazy you ask because um, it's an easy answer for me. It would be the 400 meter hurdles. Oh yeah. You know, um, um, I fell in love with the event when I was, when I was, when I was competing, I knew nothing about the, the 400 meter hurdles. Um, I retired in 2012. And my first pro athlete that I got um, to coach on the pro level in 2013 um, was Adam Durham, um, who was an American 400 meter hurdle, hurdler, 49.9, I think he ran when I got him. And he's like, hey, coach, I want to coach you. I, I was coaching at a, a junior college. Um, we had just won the junior college nationals as you know as the sprint coach there and I decided hey I want to do pro coaching and he asked me to coach him I knew nothing about the hurdles <laughs> and I didn't want to tell him I knew nothing about the hurdles um, but he allowed me to coach him and with, with the first season I improved him by seven tenths of a second so he dropped down to 49.2 um, and he made it to the finals at USA's he finished I want to say he finished top five. Um, and ever since then, I had great success coaching the 400 meter hurdles. Um, Ramel Lewis, when I got him, he was running 51 seconds in the 400 meter hurdles. I brought him down to 49.1. Um, and then he went on to do good things for Jamaica. He ran for the Jamaica national team. Um, Andre Clark, when I got Andre Clark, he ran 49.7 in the 400 hurdles. I brought him down to 48.2, you know, so I have a real knack of developing 400 meter hurdles. So hurdlers, so as much as I know about the hurdles now, Yenny K. Smith, um, female hurdler from the Turks and Caicos, when I got her, she was only 56. I brought her down to 55 low. So just all that I know about the hurdles now, if I had an opportunity to compete again, I would definitely coach myself in the 400 meter hurdles. And I think I could be a world medalist on the international stage. Oh, 400 man. meter hurdles, I would have come back and that, that would have been my event. <laughs> <laughs> that, that yes. You should have done like um, uh, Danny McFarlane. He kind of did that, right? He, he was the yes. 400 and he switched over to the hurdles, right? And he eventually, I don't know, was he self-coach? Yes, yes, he was 400. Yeah, he was self-coach. And, yeah. and a lot of the things, a lot of the things that I learned early in my coaching career, Danny McFarlane is really, really instrumental. I'm going to give him a lot of credit. Um, in 2013 and 14, when I wanted to know how to formulate my herd workouts and stuff like that, Danny was the first person I called. Like, hey, Danny, what do I do? You know what I mean? Tell me some herd workouts, you know, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty smart guy. I, 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 I do a lot of research, a lot of reading, watch a lot of videos. But Danny really gave me some inside input on, on the event and the breakdown of the workouts. Um, and Danny, Danny, Danny mentored me, I want to say, probably for three months about the hurdles. And I just took it and ran with it. Um, and, you know, sometimes even, even when I want a little bit of cleanup <laughs> as, it, as it relates to the hurdles, I call Danny and say, hey, Danny, what do you think about this? Um, so it's, just, it's, it's good, you know, having, you know, a guy like Danny 
um, who did it at the highest level to, to, to call and, and, and mentor me about the sport. It's one thing about me, you know, I, I, I have no problem picking up the phone and, and, and calling my teammates, calling the former coaches and, and asking them for advice. Um, I even think, I even hear the greatest of coaches, you know, do that. So yeah, Danny McFarlane was very instrumental in, in, in helping me um, with that 400 meter hurdle. Nice, that is dope. That is so cool. Um, yeah. So last question, just um, if you could pick a favorite place that you've traveled throughout your entire career that you've gotten to go to, where would be that place? Um, throughout my career or for vacation? <laughs> well, let, give me both. Where's the, your best place you've gone to maybe for a meet, but then where would be another place you'd go to like for vacation? Okay, so vacation, my most favorite place in the world is, is Australia. Um, I really enjoy Australia. Um, really enjoy vacation in there. Love the people, love the fact they speak English, the culture, love Australia. Um, in terms of competing, I really enjoyed competing in Kingston, Jamaica, in the National Stadium. Wow. You know, um, I I was thinking when I was at the trials um, over the over the past weekend, I was thinking about it. I said, Sanjay, you know, you made the the Jamaican national team from 1997 all the way to 2011, and you never missed the team. I enjoyed running in Kingston. I never got nervous. You know, I was looking at a lot of the athletes there and their, their anxiety and their nerves, they, they just look so scared. Um, and I think with, even with the male quartermilers, I could tell a lot of them wasn't calm um, before the race. And, and because of that, they weren't able to execute a lot of the phases in their race. They were either getting out too fast or waiting on that kick for that last hundred. Um, I was able to I was able to be very focused and courageous competing at my trials. And every time I step foot in Jamaica, I've never had a bad race in in, in the National Stadium in Kingston. I, I always enjoyed competing in Kingston. Um, and yeah, yeah, Kingston, Jamaica, favorite place to compete. Nice. Love nice. entertaining the fans at home. Nice. That is, that is amazing. That's amazing. That, I really like that because a lot of people wouldn't say their home stadium sometimes. It's, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Because for most athletes, for most Jamaican athletes competing in Jamaica is a lot of pressure for them. Nice. A, lot, a lot of pressure, <laughs> you know, um, and they hated it. You know, even one of my fellow quarter milers on the team in Sydney, me and him was talking and he was telling me, Sanjay, I hated competing in Jamaica. It was a lot of pressure. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was like, really? I, I, you know, I was like, I love competing in Jamaica. I loved it. Yeah. Uh, but it it seems like, I mean, I can imagine the pressure is like crazy, right? Because they love track. They want to see yeah. everyone do good. But it doesn't seem yeah. like anyone goes at you or boos or anything if you do bad, right? No, no. I just, I think, I think when you're from home, you know, just having, just knowing that people from your community is coming to watch you run, your parents are there, and then most of the times when we compete locally in Jamaica, it's the trials. And the trials is always a pressure situation, you know? So a lot of the athletes, they hate it. They hate trying out. They hate running home. And, and for me, I embraced it. You know, I love, I love entertaining the local fans. And I love the pressure of the moment. I, I really enjoy that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nice, nice. Well, that is, that is so dope. And yeah, just being able to, to hear, you know, coming from Jamaica, moving to New York, and then, you know, like you said, making the team for, you know, almost 15 years back to back and all the success you've had. And now the things that you're doing, giving back both coaching in the community with your businesses, I think it's like, you know, you're doing amazing things. And I really think that um, people appreciate it. So, um, Thank yeah, you. so I really appreciate it. Sanjay Air. This, this has been an amazing conversation. And yeah, thank wonderful you. speaking with you today. It's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.